Well, welcome to today's Wednesday Walkabout. And if you are new to my channel, this is the day that I really review everything that's going on in my garden. I do a little bit of work. I share some tips, but mostly it's so that you can see how it transitions over time, how quickly it transitions, and if I'm developing any problems or if there are issues in that progression as we move from one season to the other. But today I want to talk about a very, uh, I think it's a very, very important topic, and it is how to keep your garden from looking cluttered. This was inspired by Southern Living Magazine. I'm often asked to be con a contributor to different publications, and so this was the question that was posited to me for a response how to keep your garden from looking uh, cluttered. So let's go over some of those tips, but we're gonna do something a little different. We're gonna start across the street. Well, I'm starting from a different vantage point than I normally do, which is up on the terrace, on the upper terrace of the cottage. Today, I'm starting down below because this is my favorite way to approach the cottage. Coming down this street, going north, and then the cottage sits up on the corner. And while it looks very, very full, I don't necessarily think it looks cluttered. Now, you might not agree if you think it looks cluttered or if you think it looks like there's too much going on and ask yourself that question as we go through the spaces, then that, is, that may be more of a stylistic difference than one of a messy difference. Because if you don't like this, you might like things that are a little bit more linear, a little bit more uh, simpler, less layering, but layering and this kind of profusion of bloom and also evergreens is very distinctive of an English garden and I have an English garden and specifically a cottage garden. So whether you like it or not, it is appropriate to the architecture of my house. So as we, before we begin, let's, let's stop right here Stuart, before we begin, let's put an after picture and now let's put a before picture. So this is what has taken place in the past, say, gosh, 15, 16 months. So prior to this, there was nothing there but grass. If you are somebody that likes things a little bit more simplistic, you might like the grass better. And if that's the case, then you do you. That's a, an aesthetic choice. But what I wanted to point out was from a distance, it, it does not look very cluttered, but it does look complex, I think. As you get up towards the front, it indeed, I think, starts looking a little bit more, well, maybe like your eye doesn't know where to rest. So how do you mitigate that problem? Well, here would be my first suggestion. And my first suggestion would be relative to the turf. The more manicured you keep the turf in terms of edging and mowing and really clean defined edges, the more it will show as a contrast to the things that are on the inside of the garden beds, it will make it look again, just less messy. There won't be as many seed heads. There won't be rough edges. It will look very tailored and tailored does have a cleaner look. Now, if you say, but I don't like that look, I don't like to have it very, very tailored. I like some clover growing up in my lawn. I like, that's all fine and good. I completely support you and support those pollinators, but you can still have a good clean edge. You can still keep weeds out of the gutter. You can still mow a path through that more rambunctious ground cover so that it looks as if it is intentional and not just kind of, of uh, happenstance. So, that would be my first recommendation is to the extent and appropriate to your lawn and your grasses then keep it as manicured and as clean and tailored as you possibly can okay my second thing would be after a storm you need to do lots of cleanup and you can see that obviously i have not done lots of cleanup 
I have been on vacation. I just got back yesterday and there is a lot of gravel. There's a lot of clippings. There's a lot of garden debris that came down in a storm. Now, obviously you can't, you know, sometimes we just can't address that immediately. But to the extent you can do some kind of cleanup, you can pick up the big twigs, you can pick up, pick up big broken branches, you can get your handy little works blower and you can blow the gravel back in place. That will help and it takes a matter of seconds until you can do the more laborious work. Now that might seem common sense, but you would be amazed at how much difference it makes if you are intentional about doing those kinds of things. Okay, now that we've talked about the floor, <laughs> the floor of your garden, well, you know what, Stuart, let's take a break. Let's move from the floor to the ceiling after we take a little moment away. Now, I wanted to take a break because I'm really trying to consume more water, and I hope you do too. So this is just your handy little public service message about remembering to hydrate, drink plenty of fluids while you're working outside, and also put on your sunscreen. I've got a nice white cast to my skin because I slathered up before I came outside. Okay, so if the lawn and your turf is the floor, let's talk about the ceiling. Your trees really, even, sometimes I think we think they just are fixtures in our landscape. They're like a wall or a piece of furniture that seldom need to be moved and seldom need to be tended. Well, indeed, they do need to be tended and they do need to be sometimes thinned out and really closely examined. So here's an example of that. If your trees are growing uh okay let's let's pick well let's just pick out any tree in general maybe one of your trees and you're trying to mow and you run into those branches and the branches are very low hanging some of them might even be dragging on the ground it makes the turf die underneath its canopy well that has a look that is just a little messy if you prune up those lower limbs, and again, I am going to be talking about that with Dave the Tree Guy next week. If you, low, if you raise those lower limbs, it makes things look less messy. The reason being is it more clearly defines what is underneath. So for example, I'm probably going to take this one off. And if I remove, here's, here's what it looks like now. And if I remove it, see how it exposes everything that's beneath it. It makes it seem less crowded. It makes it seem less bunched up. And it makes it seem as if it's more of a design instead of just an overgrown, um, like a woodland area. Not that there's anything wrong with a woodland garden. But in my space, I want to make sure that my plants below it get adequate light, get adequate air circulation, and that they are not too shaded out by the overhanging canopy. So I can do that. The other thing I can do is remove any kind of twigginess in between the branches and I can thin out the branches as I've done with this redbud tree, again, to ensure that there's some transparency, that there's some air circulation, and it just gives it kind of a neater appearance than when it is just too dense and everything below it looks like it's struggling. So those are two different tips related to the ceiling and the floor of your house. Now, what about all of the furnishings? What about all of the throw pillows? What about all of those kinds of things that bloom, that provide color, um, that you just have to have? Well, there is a certain methodology to that too. Starting out with probably my favorite garden design principle and that is the rhythm and repetition of a design element across the space. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, let's take a break here and then I'm gonna show you several examples of that. 
Now, in addition to that principle of the rhythm and repetition of a design element across the space, it's also really important, I think, to have architectural plants that lay the foundation for all of the other things that are going to come and go over the course of the growing season and may die back in the winter time. And for me, you guys know, if you follow me for any length of time, it's traditionally, it's been boxwood. I also love hollies and a few other evergreens. But if you'll notice, if you kind of Stuart span from down at the bottom of the hill to the top of the hill, you see this rhythm and repetition of not only a plant material, i.e. boxwood, but also shapes. So there's lots of boxwood balls that start down here and they go all the way up to, bless you, Stuart, bless you. <laughs> They go all the way up to just below the window box and then that shape is repeated in the topiaries on the porch and just right in front of the parlor windows. So that is something that is moving from one area of the garden to the other area of the garden and it provides cohesion and it provides kind of a really good canvas for all of these other things to play on. Now in your garden, that rhythm and repetition may be of other things. It might be beautiful uh, large grasses. It might be something all in tonal grays if you live in California. It might be something else, but it's that rhythm and repetition across the space that's so effective. Now it's not only effective with your evergreens, it's also effective with colors. So let's take an example right here. Let me move to this space. And if you look up this east side of my garden, you can see a number of different things blooming. And you can see kind of two or three predominant colors. So color is another design element that you can use in repetition to add cohesion to your garden. So you can see these beautiful penstemon. I've got one, two, three, and there's another one beyond that you can't see that's not quite as large. And this beautiful stream of purple really makes it look as if it all belongs together. Imagine, if you will, that I had either this same plant or I had different plants and they were all in different colors. They all had different leaf forms. They all had different growing habits. And that could contribute to a garden that looks a little bit more cluttered. This is the way to avoid that. You'll also notice that in addition to the rhythm and repetition of the plant and the purple foliage, that there's also along the edge a rhythm and repetition of gold. So that gold weaves its way in and out of this beautiful purple in the form of different kinds of plants, but they're all in a similar hue. So I've got sunshine ligustrum, I've got golden feverfew, and there's also some lemon lime nandina. And that actually not only continues that way, but that whole pattern begins up front because there's the ligustrum there. It comes here with some lemon lime or with some uh, kaleidoscope abelia, I've got some lemon and uh, colored leucanthemum here, and so this whole stream of this color palette begins to move towards that sidewalk. Now something that I did when I came home because it was really bugging me was this Minoan lace it is fabulous. I have cut bouquet after bouquet of it, but it's gotten a little bit too rambunctious. <laughs> I wouldn't say invasive. It looks spectacular from a distance, but up close, it really looks like it's crowding some of these plants. So I've got more thinning out to do over here, just like I thinned out the branches of my redbud tree. 
I have already thinned it out over here because I wanted all of these plantings to kind of stand in isolation and to have their own integrity. And so it doesn't look so messy and so cluttered because I have restricted where I let that Minoan lace invade or, or kind of become part of, of this tableau, I have restricted it and right now it's confined to this space. Do I still need to take out more? Yes, I will. That is stuff that happens while you're on vacation. But I have to say, even though it's invasive or not, I shouldn't say invasive, I keep saying that. It's not invasive. I've just let it take over a little bit too much. And it's very easy to pull out and I'll demonstrate that shortly. But even though it is kind of overgrown here, it nevertheless is absolutely glorious. Stuart, would you agree with that? Yeah. It, it's beautiful and from a distance and coming home at night it was really really wonderful okay let's move on to some other tips And here I am with my best superwoman pose. <laughs> so I'm going to pull out some of this Minoan lace. I could leave it, but I've still got plenty to be able to make all sorts of gorgeous arrangements and also to create the design effect that I want. Now the best time to do this if you really want to take out or edit out, I should say, large areas of something, then obviously the best time to do that is after a rain. And it rained pretty heavily, I understand, while I was gone, Stuart. It did. So I'm going to come in here and I just am going to start thinning this out a little bit. And you can see how easily it pulls. Now this is a member of the carrot family. Oh, Isn't I didn't it? Know it that. Yes, it is a member of the carrot family. Well, it looks kind of like a carrot. The foliage definitely looks like a carrot. But I think it's just really, really beautiful. But too much of anything, even if it's a good thing, is still too much. So I'm just going to thin this out some. Now you may say, well, why didn't you do this when it was smaller? Well, because I just didn't know how successful it would be. Yeah, you couldn't have known where I, it was going Yeah, I yet. didn't really know that it would perform just as beautifully as it has performed. And it really, really has. It's crazy. You can't tell you've pulled. I know you haven't pulled a lot out yet. But, but the you, little bit you've pulled, you can't tell at all. That it's yeah, yeah, because it's, <laughs> yeah. But notice now how there is more negative space in between, in between the blooms. So let's do this over here. I guess comparatively there. to the other area, it does there. look thinner. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. That's better. So you can now <laughs> see some of, you can now see a little bit more of the purple that's growing around it. There. <laughs> and you just keep pulling till you get the effect you want. And should I perhaps the other thing that I feel like is being a little too crowded is this boxwood. Now, had I not already made a huge bouquet of this for our coffee corner moment, but look at that. Isn't it spectacular? It really, really is. Okay, now this one, that, that does it. Now, it kind of opens up this whole area therein contributing to it looking less overgrown and a little less colored now a little less cluttered now the other thing that i will probably do is if you want to know well how do i decide what to pull out i start out by pulling some things around my foundation plants because they're the ones that i really want to highlight so i'm pulling out a lot of this that's around that Sunshine Ligustrum. And also kind of around some of the stepping stones. Is this a little heartbreaking? Yes, it is a little heartbreaking. But just imagine that all of what remains is going to put out seed. So I will have more than <laughs> enough seed to do this again. 
Does this require a little bit of work? Yes, it does. But I'd rather, I guess, be pulling out this and making bouquets out of it than weeding this same space because where this wasn't growing, weeds moved in. So, there you go. Thinning out something that is a little bit too abundant in your garden can also give your, your planting areas a little bit more breathing room, a little bit more negative space, and make it look as if it's a little bit more intentional and a little less overgrown. So to get that perfect kind of billowy cottage garden look that looks as if it's completely untended, you actually need to tend it some. <laughs> okay, let's move on to another tip. Now, if you've got a really large blooming specimen like this It's a Breeze rose that bloomed spectacularly, then you might want to devote some time to doing nothing but deadheading it after it's bloomed. You, sometimes, you know, you might even incorporate somebody to help you do that, recruit some help. But it will really make a difference. So now, look at all the new buds that's, that are coming out and the fact that if the, oh, wow. yeah, if the entire plant were covered in could, dead this blooms that. like this, like these, you can see how this plant would look not nearly so beautiful and the garden not nearly so tidied and look a lot more cluttered. So to the extent you really tend and deadhead, especially your blooming shrubs, it just makes a world of difference. The other thing that you might want to do is look at the profile of your plants and see if they have an outlier in terms of the way that they grow, an outlier branch that really isn't doing what you want it to do. For example, this Miss Lemon Abelia. Let me get some different pruners. It's beautiful. It has a wonderful arching habit. And if I were growing it in an area that was not so confined, man, I would really let it arch and cascade and billow and do its thing. But this is planted in an area that's a little bit more confined. Now I want to answer a question here that someone asked recently, do, why do I not grow forsythia? I adore forsythia. I think it's absolutely beautiful. It's one of the clarions of spring. However, I think for it to be its most beautiful, it needs just that. It needs, like a large abelia, room to really spread and grow and its branches arch over say a lakeside or a stream or something like that or an area of the garden cascading down a hill to really I think optimize its potential. I don't have those kind of spaces here so that's why I don't grow it but do I love it? Absolutely. Do I encourage other people to grow it? Absolutely. Particularly if you have a landscape that's far larger than mine. But back to my tip, <laughs> I've got some outlying branches that are really getting large and they're beautiful and I do to a certain degree really like the way they insinuate their ways their way into other growing things but this is a passage yeah. and so I don't really want things to obstruct the passage I want the, to, them to come out and I want them to soften the edge of this path but I don't want them to grow into it and so I am going to cut this back a little bit cutting back any dead wood. You can't even tell really that I've clipped it. Is it true that outliers are sometimes the thing you can topiary? Yes, absolutely. So if I, if I somehow wanted to root this, then yes, I could take one of these outlier, good point, br branches, say if it was a boxwood or something, I could try to root it with some um, 
some compound. I could stick it in the dirt in even an right area. Out of the plant, yeah, even right out of the there. plant, let it keep growing. Sometimes it might even be possible with this. That would be an experiment worth taking. But I don't need any more of it in this <laughs> area right now. So I'm going to discard this these clippings. But my, aren't they beautiful? Well, they'd go really pretty with the white, too. The, and they could be part of a larger arrangement. Again, I'm not going to make that today because I've already made one. <laughs> So just by keeping some of your, your cascading plants a little bit trimmed, I think, that's, I think that's helpful. Another thing that is helpful is having the rhythm and repetition of not only color and form, but also plant textures. So I've got repeated but a variety of textures moving through Lemon Lane. And while they are all very consistent in terms of their color palette, nevertheless, some of them are glossy. Some of the leaves are more rounded. Some of the leaves <clears throat> are more lance-like. Some of them are variegated. Some of them are not. Some of them are fern-like. But that repetition of all of those different kinds of textures is also repeated up and down this space. And for me, I accomplished that with Miss Lemon Abelia, with Lemon Lime Nandina, with uh, Golden Fever Few, and with Miss Lemon Abelia. Did I say that twice? Maybe. I don't know if I did. Anyhow, those <laughs> are the plants that I used through here. Now, another thing that can help you keep your plants, keep your garden looking a little less cluttered, is when a perennial is past its prime, cut it back. So this is an example of that. So in here, I've got this beautiful it euphorbia. It's just beautiful, and I could keep it here, but it's starting to dry, and I want this whole area in here to get a little bit better air circulation, and I also want this, Miss Lemon Abelia, to get a little bit more light, and this is actually past its prime. So I'm going to cut this. Those are not buds. These are not buds. Oh. These are past buds. They are finished buds, if you will. And yes, this does, this euphorbia that was gifted to me by my friend Carlina, it does ooze a kind of sap. Oh, okay. So if you are sensitive to that sap, then you might want to make sure that you have gloves on when you're doing this. So see how this really opens up this space? I can see that in here I've got a little bit of Bermuda growing up. I can do some clipping on the woodiness of this abelia. But this abelia will be so much happier now because it has more room and more light. And I won't have those dead seed heads when they get even browner. So, see how it looks? That makes it look a little less cluttered? Mm -hmm. I think that's important. The other thing that I think is very, very important to address, and that is scale. To the extent you can afford it, and you think you can get that plant acclimated to your garden, then typically a bigger specimen is better than a smaller specimen. A bigger pot is typically better. One bigger pot is typically better than three tiny little pots that always are suffering and that always need to be watered, topiary being the exception. But if you have larger things, it just makes things look a little less cluttered than if you have, well, just think of a bunch of, think of this, this. You have a, a living room. It's where your kids play. And there's a bunch of like 
little Legos and little toys and, and little building blocks and things like that. And they're scattered all around. That looks very messy and it looks very cluttered, albeit very fun. <laughs> Versus if you had that same space and you had a couple, say maybe three huge stuffed animals. That would look far less cluttered, far easier to clean up, and it would make everything look a little more more neat and, and tidier. So that's kind of the principle there. It's a question of scale. So if you're thinking about doing an assemblage of pots, do three larger pots, mama bear, papa bear, and baby bear, then maybe six different pots. And while you're doing it, try to keep uh, try to restrict the variety of materials that you use. So if you're going to have a bunch of pots, don't have necessarily terracotta and glazed blue and glazed orange and plastic and whatever. You can, but it would be much more effective visually and look a lot less cluttered if you had all of them in one type of of material, say all concrete or all glazed in the same color or maybe two or three, but they all kind of have the same hue. So that's another tip. And lastly, speaking of scale, here is my question of the day at the very end. <laughs> and that is I've come to a big decision point over here on the west side because I have been so good about pinching back this dusty miller it has gotten just huge and because we've gotten a lot of rain, it's gotten even huger, if that's a word. <laughs> so much so that it doesn't look in balance with what is growing along here and as importantly, if not more, what's growing along the east side of the upper terrace. This kind of stands out as a great big old bully. So here is my question of the day. If you were me, what would you do? Would you cut it back hard, restrict its size, let it start all over again? Would you cut it back, dig it up, divide it, let it start all over again? Would you dig it up like this, cut it back, but knowing that it would ultimately and hopefully grow back to this size and move it someplace else, maybe to this big void in here? So those are some of the different options that I'm thinking about with this Dusty Miller. I have, I don't know what conditions Dusty Miller especially thrive in, but whatever they are recently, right here, <laughs> right here but recently we have had them because look at the size of this and look at the size of that. If I do cut this back, I will do it in the early morning and probably make a huge bouquet using this and some of that Minoan lace. That would be spectacular. And if you don't believe me <laughs> that we've had the perfect conditions for Dusty Miller, <laughs> look up here. Oh, wow. Look at how this Dusty Miller has filled out in short order. If we can, let's try to put a before and after of this up. Just realize I'm in the reflection. Yeah, yeah, in the reflection. So, <laughs> that, so that is that. Another thing that can make your garden look cluttered is if you've got wires like this that are out. I pulled these out because we've gotten so much rain and I turned the sprinkler system off. But obviously, I'd want to put those back in position and secure them. I would want to roll up my hose. I would want to move my wheelbarrow and all of those different things. And quite often, you guys, a number of times people have commented, Linda, your garden is so cluttered. Well, a lot of times that's because you're seeing it in transition. You're seeing it as I am working things out, as I'm trying to 
figure out where I want to put this pot or that pot. Um, and because of that, yes, it often does look cluttered because sometimes things have to look ugly before they are beautiful. And on that note, Stuart, let's just do a pretty pan. Look at this. Look at this over here. It really is looking beautiful right now. And I guess I would be remiss if I didn't give an update on the pumpkin. I'm just waiting for some of these flowers to get pollinated. Some of these female flowers to get pollinated so that I might get a little pumpkin. And I'm trying to help that along by having some blooming thyme right here to attract some pollinators. Plenty of time. Mm. And this smells, that. here Stuart, I'm gonna stick this up your nose. Oh, wow. Wow, isn't it incredible? That's, Lemony, that's lemon time. Oh, it is lemon time. And okay, pretty yeah. soon, speaking of fragrance, another gardenia will probably come out. This is one of the out. neatest, like, just the foliage. So yeah, cool. the foliage is wonderful. So there you go, guys. There is your Wednesday walkabout. Hopefully you learned a little bit. Please comment below. If you have not subscribed, please hit that subscribe button, share with others, and just let us know what your thoughts are on this topic. I'm sure, I, by the way, I'm sure I missed some other tips. And if you've got tips to share with the rest of this community, make sure to put them below. Take care.